impact. We talked about forgiveness. We talked about how we ought to forgive one another. We talked about a judgment and judging righteous judgment and not judging the wrong kind of judgment. We talked about limitless love for one another. And then last week we talked about the courage to connect, the courage to connect. And so as we're thinking through all of these things, none of these have been simple. Like all of these have been very difficult to swallow because they require so much of us. You're talking about forgiveness. That requires so much. You're talking about not judging others. You're talking about whether you're talking about limitless love, whether you're talking about going outside of our comfort zones and, and connecting to one another. These are all difficult things. These are all difficult things. Until, so today, I wanted to share with you briefly about how it is that we can enter into those relationships what is it that gives us the strength and the power to do that? First of all, we have seen, we've seen over the last few weeks some of the things that God wants us to do in terms of relationships. But this morning, I want to call your attention to the power of relationships and that Christians, firstly, are called to radical relationships. Christians are called to radical relationships. What do we mean by radical? Well, the word radical means out of the ordinary. Something above and beyond what is that which is normally known or normally experienced. It's a cut above. It's radical. It's different. And scripture makes it clear that the level that God calls us to in our relationships is a radical level of relationship. Radical by anyone's standards, especially by the world's standards. You know, all of, us, uh, all of us have this tendency to love a good bargain. We love getting a good deal on something. We shop around, you know, those of us that get up at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning on a Friday, you know, to do the garage sales or a Saturday, you know, you know who you are, you sick people. But those of you that do that, you understand the, 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 the necessity of getting a, a good deal. You know, you want to get that. I don't care if it's a garage sale, a secondhand store, a, a clearance rack, a discount bargain bin at the, at the mall or whatever. We all like getting a good deal. But sometimes, folks, we find those deals and it says... Big sign right above the thing, it says, as is. As is. So as we approach that bargain bin or that clothes rack that says, as is, we kind of think, hmm, I wonder what that means. Like, what do they mean when they say, as is? Well, stores have different words for it. Some of them call them slightly irregular, right? Some of them call them seconds. But here's the bottom line. We all understand one thing about them, and that is at the end of the day, they are damaged goods. In some form, in some way, in some fashion, these are damaged goods, and that's why they're sold as is. There's no returns, no refunds, no money back, no exchanges. But the kicker is that the sign never tells you what's wrong with that article of clothing or that piece of merchandise. You notice it never says that? It just says as is. It never says, oh, by the way, it has a hole in it at the sleeve on the left side. It never says, you know, the zipper doesn't quite zip right. It never says there's a stain on it or there's a crooked seam or, or anything like that. It just says as is. But here's the bottom line. There will be, there will be a flaw. There will be a defect. There will be a problem. So don't be surprised is what the company's saying. They're saying, look, don't be surprised. That's what as is means. Don't be surprised. Don't come back to us. Don't whine. Don't expect your money back because it's as is. And so all of us kind of get that for the most part. But here's the thing. For some reason, when you and I interact with one another, we forget that we come as is. We somehow expect one another to have it all together. <laughs> to have our ducks in a row, to somehow be able to, to uh, uh, have a relationship one, with one another that has no flaws, no scars, no problems, no issues, no difficulties. And that's crazy. Because at the end of the day, we have to realize that we are living in the as-is section of the universe, especially when it comes to relationships. We are all slightly irregular we all have tags that say defective in some way. We're flawed. We're imperfect. We're defective. We're damaged. And this is what makes relationships so hard. It makes it so hard. Because expectations minus reality equals 
disappointment. And so, so often we're disappointed and we're disillusioned with one another. And it puts a strain on our relationship. And Jesus, by the way, was keenly aware of this. And yet, and yet, he came looking for us. He wasn't just willing to pay the discount price for us. He was willing to pay the highest price for us, knowing that we're damaged goods. And he still buys us. That's like crazy. And in Matthew <coughs> chapter 9, verse 11, sorry guys, I'm still dealing with this cold. Three weeks now. Hopefully I'm going to get over it. Matthew chapter 9, verse 11. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, this is, this is like what the Pharisees really wanted to know. Isn't it funny? Out of all the things they could have asked Jesus, this is what they, like, this is your question? Really? This is it? You couldn't come up with anything better? Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why did they ask this question? Because they were so blown away by it. Like, why would he do that? They, like, couldn't he hang out with some better people, with some higher quality people? Why is he over there with the dregs? Why is he over there at the discount bargain bin? Why is he over there with the irregulars, with the flaws? See, because Jesus engaged in radical relationships. Listen, in radical relationships with people regardless of who they are. Regardless of how messed up they were. Because he knew ahead of time. See, here's the thing about you and me. We are all screwed up in our own special way, aren't we? I know I am. Some of us are better than, at hiding it than others. Some of us, some of us our screwed upness is, is pretty visible right on the outside. You know, five minutes, yep, that dude's screwed up. Some people, it takes months, years. It takes some depth, right? Right? And then you go, ooh, never knew that about that guy. He's really not the same guy he is at church that he is at home, is he? See, so some of us are better at hiding things. John Haddington said, I have been comforted by the thought that Jesus welcomes not only sensible sinners, but stupid ones as well. Isn't that great? I just feel better about myself now. That's great. See, if we want to be considered part of God's family, catch this. If you want to be considered part of God's family, then you need to resemble the way that God treats his people. You need to resemble the way that Jesus interacts and has relationships with people. You want to claim to follow Christ? You want to claim to be part of his family? You want to be in the kingdom of God, the family of God? You had better have a family resemblance. If we want to be considered part of God's family, we must treat people the way that Jesus treated people. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50 says, For whoever... There we go, we got it. Boy, that thing's having a hard time this morning. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is, listen, my brother and my sister and my mother... See, this is a situation where, where, where people came up to Jesus and said, hey, your, your mother and your brothers are out there. Because he was surrounded by this huge crowd, right? And they said, hey, your mother and your brothers are out there and they want to talk to you. And he's like, well, but who's my mother and my brothers and my sister? I'll tell you who it is. It's those who do the will of my father. See, he wasn't, this wasn't a slight against his personal family, against his physical family. Quite the contrary. What he's saying is, look, if you are part of me and you're following me, then you will resemble what I'm like, and you'll be part of my family too, just as much as they are. Just as much as my physical uh, uh, mother is. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Why? Why do we have to have these kind of radical relationships with people? Why can't we just kind of have the kind of normal, usual relationships that most people have, you know? Some of them are real troubled. Some of them have issues. I don't like somebody, I just kind of take off, you know. Here's why. Because if we don't have radical relationships, if you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, do not have these kind of radical relationships with people, then the world will not know that God the Father sent Jesus. You say, where do you get that from? I'll show you.
See, the problem is, if you and I don't have radical relationships with people, our gospel, our message, the things we say and speak and proclaim will be ineffective. It'll be ineffective. Why? Because radical relationships empower effective evangelism. Radical relationships empower effective evangelism. You say, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a problem with this evangelism thing. Not going so well. The power of our message depends on the quality of our relationships. The quality of our relationships will determine the effectiveness of the gospel message that we share. My mom said, and she was an atheist, still is, and the many times I've tried to share the gospel with her, she has on many occasions said to me, you know, that, that stuff you're sharing with me sounds good, but here's the problem. I've known too many Christians. I've known too many Christians. Like how... How sad and sick is that? You don't think our relationships with people affect the, the, the message that we speak? Mahatma Gandhi said these words, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. If Christians would really live according to the teachings of Christ as found in the Bible, all of India would be Christian today. That's what Gandhi said. Is that a wake-up call? Whew. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 22 through 24 says, But be doers of the word, not hearers only who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word of God and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Can you imagine that? Imagine getting up in the morning. You get up, you blow your nose, you ooze out of bed, you stumble in the bathroom, you turn on the light, you look in the mirror, eh, good, and you walk away. Crazy, right? Like, who does that? Nobody does that. But this passage says, yeah, somebody does that. We do that sometimes. Us Christians who look at the word of God and walk away unchanged. He's saying it's crazy what we're doing. See, the love of God, the love of God, if you say you love God, if I say I love God, then my claim to love God has to translate into something. What it has to translate into is action that fulfills his commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15 says, this is, this is Jesus speaking here. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And that includes his commandments to how we should relate to one another, how we should love one another, how we should care for one another, how we should not judge one another. All of those things. And then he says something profound. Something that really is a game changer, at least for me, as I read it. He says in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 21, as he's speaking to his father, Jesus here. And Pastor Tim read this moments ago. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Okay? That they may all be one. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about you and I. He's talking about that you and I may be all one, all of us who believe in, in this word. Now catch this. Here's the kicker. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they may also be one, so that, why? What's the big deal? Here's why. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. You know what the opposite of that is? See, this is a formula. If my people are one, then the world will believe that you have sent me, Lord. You took that formula and turned it on its head. If we are not one, then the world will never believe that the Father has sent Jesus into the world. And when we speak about Jesus, they're like, yeah, whatever. I like your Christ. just don't like you Christians. Like Gandhi said, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Oh, ouch, that hurts. 
when I think about that. It hurts when I think about that. See, here's the thing. Unity in Christian relationships, unity as a church, New Hope, is going to be the single greatest factor to our church health and subsequent church growth. I don't care how good the messages are, how well planned they are, how awesome Jeff rocks it with worship and leads us, and he does a fantastic job, how good everything is and how nice the building smells and looks. And all those things are important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not important. Those are tremendously important. But folks, we can have all of those things. And if we don't experience the power of radical gospel-changed relationships in this church that make us one, game over. You can hang it up. And the world, if it ever should come through those doors, will never believe our message because it's like, yeah, whatever. You guys are just like everybody else. And that's why Jesus is saying this. Radical relationships empower effective evangelism. That's the bottom line. And lastly, lastly, (coughs) radical relationships require a supernatural source. Because here's the facts, folks. It's not about me standing up here and giving you, you know, seven steps to better relationships. I mean, I can do that, and there's some good things in Scripture, don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, it all has to boil down to this. Radical relationships require a supernatural source. That's what God is asking us to do. He's not asking us just to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, hey, get it together. Come on, guys, let's do a better job. It's not what he's saying. You say, well, what does that mean? Have you ever felt like, um, have you ever felt like you're kind of walking a little outside of his will, maybe? Maybe you're tired. Maybe, Maybe you found it difficult or even felt like it's impossible to have these kind of relationships with people, even even among Christians. And so you just kind of quit trying. You just kind of hang it up. You just kind of give it up. You say, ah, whatever. Why is it so hard for us to obey God's will? Why? Because we are damaged goods. We're damaged goods. We're broken. And our ability thereby to have healthy relationships is tremendously limited. You know, we can try to put on the nice face, right? We can try to cover it up a little bit. Hi, how you doing? I hate that guy. Right? So we can kind of kind of try to fake it in our own ability, in our own power. Or we can kind of do it God's way. We need a supernatural church. We need a supernatural source of strength for our radical relationships. Did you know that you and I, you and I can be carnal Christians? There is such a thing. We can be carnal Christians. See, all Christians have the Holy Spirit living inside them. It's a guarantee. It's a promise that happened upon believing in Christ. But here's something else that can happen. We can begin to walk according to the flesh rather than walking by the Spirit, rather than walking in accordance with the Spirit. And when that happens, we lose our ability to have radical relationships. In fact, we lose our ability to do a lot of things that God commands us to do because the power to obey these commands does not come from us, but it is in us because it is the Holy Spirit who lives within us that gives us the power to obey Jesus. That's how it works. Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And then John chapter 14 verse 15 through 17 says this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Remember we just read that a while ago? Here's the rest of it. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. How? How do we do that? Just try harder. Here's how. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Holy Spirit of truth, 
through whom the world cannot receive, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. That is the power, folks, that we have to tap into. You know, uh, I've got to confess something to you. For much of my Christian life, I didn't grasp this. I, I'm not sure I still do, but fully. But, but for much of my Christian life, I thought, yeah, okay, that's, that's cool, you know, and all, and the Holy Spirit lives inside me. But, but you know, I, I, after all, i got to do it, right? I mean, i got to kind of do all this stuff, don't I? I? I get that he lives in me, and somehow, I don't know, maybe he intercedes for my prayers or something. But, but look, bottom line, let's get real. i got to do this stuff, right? No. You don't have to do it. In fact, here's the weird thing. You see, I used to get mad. I used to get really, really mad at those bumper stickers, those Christian bumper stickers that, say, that, that said, uh, oh, what is it they used to say? Um, uh, let go, let God. Remember that? Remember those Christian bumpers saying, let go, let God. I'm like, what does that even mean? What do you mean, let go, let God? No, you got to try hard and then let God do, you know, something. But you got to try hard. You got to, you know. Here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't try hard. But what I'm saying is really, really, really the truth is at the end of the day, you do have to let go. Because the power that can enable you to have radical relationships is the power of the Holy Spirit working inside you to the point where you surrender your will to him and you allow his will and his life and his power to course through you so that you can have the ability to obey Jesus in what he's commanded you to do. And that's how it works. You can only do it through him. We must come to the point where we accept our complete inability to ultimately affect change in ourselves without the Holy Spirit. Walking by the Spirit requires a full, listen, it requires not just an intellectual assent to the fact that the Holy Spirit's in us. It requires a full personal surrender. You say, God, I've been trying this mess for 20 years. I've been trying to, don't get me wrong, I love you, and I've been trying to obey you, but I've got all this mess in my life, and I've been working on this and trying harder for 20 years, and I still can't get it. What's wrong? Are you walking in the Spirit? Are you using the tools He's given you? Have you put on the full armor, armor of God? Are you asking him to live through you and in you? We must come to accept our inability to affect change. Walking by the Spirit requires full personal surrender. Because spiritual battles, folks, <laughs> spiritual battles aren't fought with physical weapons. Because they're spiritual. I don't know if you remember, I'm sure many of you do, Corey Tenboom. Corey Ten Boom, the, the woman that, that uh, has long been honored by Christians as, as an example of faith and action. Of course, she was arrested by the Nazis along with the rest of her family for hiding Jews in their home during the Holocaust. She was imprisoned and eventually sent to Ravensbrück concentration camp along with her sister Betsy. And Betsy, of course, ended up dying there in Ravensbrück. Corey's own release... Uh, on December 31st, 1944, she was finally out, and her sister's death inspired uh, her to go and continue to live her life in helping people. Betsy's example of selfless love and forgiveness amid extreme cruelty and persecution inspired Corey to establish a post-war home <coughs> for other concentration camp survivors trying to recover from the horrors that they've experienced and escaped. She went on, of course, to travel the world widely as a missionary preaching God's forgiveness and the need for relational reconciliation, for relational reconciliation. And she wrote the book, The Hiding Place. You may have read it or heard of it. And in this book, here's what she said. Listen to these words from Corey Tembu. Trying to do the Lord's work in your own strength is the most confusing, the most exhausting, and the most tedious work of all. But when you are filled with His Holy Spirit, 
then the ministry of Jesus just flows out of you. You get that? See it? I walked with Christ for a long time before any of that started coming clear. And I'm still trying to grasp it, quite honestly. Fully. But the bottom line is, folks, radical obedience and radical relationships require a supernatural source. You just don't have the power to do it in you. We must walk by His Spirit. So I want to invite you to do something this morning. I want to invite you... Hug your neighbor. No, I'm just kidding. I want to invite you to start, to start living a life that walks in accordance with the Spirit. It doesn't count if you're married. Come on, quit that. I want you to invite you to start living a life in accordance with the power of the Spirit that's inside you. Not just intellectual assent to the truths and the facts of the gospel, but actually start living in accordance with the power of the gospel that He's given us. Do you realize He just hasn't given us facts and information and said, okay, now go and do. He hasn't done that. I want to invite you to let his power this morning transform your marriages, transform the way you interact with your coworkers, transform the way that you deal with that difficult person in your life that you've struggled with for years. I want you to allow the power of his Holy Spirit living through you to radically change your relationships, to transform your relationship with your children, to transform the way we treat one another here. And to transform the way that we touch the rest of the world with the gospel and the power of Jesus Christ. See, I'm convinced of one thing. God has given us so many blessings. So many instruments of power. So many tools. So many weapons of warfare. So much power through the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. He's giving us all these things, and yet somehow you and I somehow end up most of the time walking in our own strength. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Why do I do that? Folks, we need to be reminded that the gospel that the power that's given to us through the gospel is more than just words on a page, more than just admonitions to do this or to do that. But he has equipped us with everything we need through the power of the gospel. I am going to introduce you to the gospel right now. You are a rebel. Whether you want to acknowledge it or not, I'll tell you straight up. You are a rebel against the living God. This is your natural disposition. Why? Because you were born in sin. We are in a prison cell. And it takes the awakening and the grace of God, you call it the provenient grace of God, to awaken us to the fact that we are lost and we can't get out. We're headed towards destruction fast. The enemy, because of our rebellion against God, has legal rights to harm and harass our life. There you are behind the prison cell. Help! I need out! You can't get out. Those prison bars are stronger than any adamant. There is no way you can cut them because they're stronger than diamond. It is impenetrable. You cannot escape. You're doomed because when the enemy comes in in the very end and he's going to finish you off because he has legal right to do it and he's going to relish every minute of it. In strolls your intercessor, your mighty man stands between you and that accuser and he takes the hit that was rightfully yours he takes the blow that was intended for you that is an extraordinary reality that he was turned to a pulp and he actually died God died for you over your prison cell it has always said condemned separated eternally from God guilty And then suddenly it switches. When you realize what Jesus Christ has done, it says justified. It says forgiven, redeemed. Here's the problem. 
Most of us have stopped with the good news right there. The blood of Jesus Christ has been shed and he was killed. I want you to know that is unbelievable news. But we are still in a prison cell. And so we're praising God from within a prison cell going, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for changing the sign on the outside of the prison. And God's word says, could you check the door to the prison cell? Because my blood was shed for more, for more than just forgiveness. Forgiveness was the avenue through which he could make the escape for us. He isn't just interested in dealing with the consequences or the penalty of sin. He's also dealt with the problem of sin. Test the door. It's unlocked. The door to the prison cell is unlocked. Walk out. Smell the open air of freedom and liberty in the life of Jesus Christ. When you get outside the prison cell, there's like this chariot that's waiting. Emissaries from the king, and they say, the king beckons you into his presence. You know how bizarre this is when you realize that you were a rebel? That you were undeserving completely? The living God has literally given up his life for you, and now he has set you free, and now the very king is beckoning you into his presence? It's like, are you sure you have the right guy here? I'm a rebel. I, I stood against my God. I spat in his face. How, how could he want me? The king beckons you. You get in the chariot. And as you're pulling into the kingdom, you're looking for where they might drop you off. You're looking for that poor district. You're saying, where, where are you taking me? Well, into the very near presence of the king. He wants you to live right where he lives. Not just the penalty, not just the problem, but an invitation into his very near presence. But as you're coming in, the emissaries say, he wants to adopt you as his child. Me? His child? We are brought in and invited near to share his heart. You come into his presence totally broken before the reality of what he has done for you. I don't deserve this. Why have you done this for me? I love you. I have a commission for you. For me? You want to have me work for you? I want you to work for me. I want you to represent me. Absolutely. Anything I can do for you, just tell me. I need you to go back to that prison cell that I took you out of. Because there's a whole bunch more that need to know about me and my love and my truth. Will you go for me? In a heartbeat, I would, I would gladly serve you any way you want, any way you ask. I need to forewarn you. I'm going to send you out and you'll be as a sheep among wolves. They'll kill you. They'll destroy you. They'll hate you. They'll persecute you. They will do whatever they can to harm you. I'm in. I'll do it, God. I don't care. You shed your blood for me. I would gladly shed my blood for you. Take my body. Take my blood. Spend it any way you want. I belong to you in, in covenant. Take me, Lord Jesus. Send me the commission, not just the penalty, not just the problem, not just the invitation to his very near presence, not just the adoption as a son and a daughter of the King of Kings, but we are commissioned to represent him. And I want you to realize that is a privilege beyond all other privileges to bear the very name, the very image, the very reputation of God Almighty. And he says, I ask you to go. Go and make disciples of all men. Go and be unashamed of my gospel and preach it. Go, rescue the lost in the power of my name. For is not the lamb that was slain worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. I'll go. And as you're beginning to head out with his blessing, he says, hold it. Wait, there's one more thing. Not just the penalty. Not just the problem. Not just the invitation to his very near presence. Not just the adoption as a son or a daughter of the king. And not just the commission. This is the capstone. If you think that is all good, you could wrap that all up into one ball and it still falls short of the final one. Because this final one is so condescending on the part of our king. It is so bewildering. It is so extraordinary. so amazing. And this is the truth that turns the world upside down. Before you go. What I'm sending you out to do is impossible. I know. Impossible. And if you do it in your own strength, you'll fail. I don't care. I'm willing to do whatever you ask of me. And if you want me to go in there and just die, I'm willing. 
I'm sending you out to be a victor. My children will not lose. Would you give me your body? And I will come in and make it my home. And I will take those hands of yours and make them my hands. I will take those feet of yours and make them my feet. I will take that mouth of yours and it will speak my words. I will take those eyes of yours and they can now see what I need you to be seen in this world. And I will take your heart of stone and make it a heart of flesh so that it will beat with my burdens and you will care for the very things that I care about. And your prayers will become my prayers. And your life and your attitude and your behavior every minute of every day will be the very behavior of God. Will you allow me to overtake your life? Because then we go into this world as little lambs with the faces of lions. Because the living God Almighty, the consuming, almighty, sovereign God dwells within his children. And as we stand and the wolf pack surrounds us, we stand in the authority in the name of Jesus and we will not back down. Because we do not head off to war to lose. We head off to war to win. Our God mocks all the powers of earth and hell through fluffy little lambs because his lambs beat the wolf packs. That's the gospel. The gospel trounces upon all the powers of earth and hell and demonstrates to the universe the manifold wisdom of God that he is in control. And even though we look weak, and even though physically and naturally we are weak, spiritually greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. That is good news. And it is a lot better than what's being dealt out today in the church. We need to rise up, proclaim the gospel, and say, I'm unashamed of it. Dear Lord Jesus, take what is rightfully yours. Don't just send us. Send us with yourself. Firmly planted within our souls. We cannot do your work. We cannot bring you glory. Even though we're willing to do it without you. Please, if you want to come with us, why in the world would we ever try? pull off the impossible on your own. You don't have to fail any longer. Your God is ready to do it in and through you. You can't do it. You can't muster up the discipline. You can't muster up the intellect. You can't muster up the strength. You can't muster up the perseverance and the fortitude. He can. You can't love the lost. You can't love those that spit upon your face. He can. Don't Pray that God would teach you how to love like he loves. Pray that he would fill you with himself and he would love in and through you. Don't pray that he would teach you to have joy. Pray that the living God full of joy would enter into you. Don't pray that he would teach you how to be peaceful. Ask for the God of peace, the Prince of Peace to infill you. Because if you try and imitate in your own strength, you will be a miserable replica. But if you allow the impartation of Jesus Christ to overtake you, Suddenly, it all works because it's him imitating himself. And he's very good at being God. How long have we struggled trying to uh, imitate what we couldn't imitate? I hope you'll allow God's Holy Spirit and his power and all the tools afforded to us by the gospel to work through you in a way that will transform your life and transform this church and transform the world with the gospel. Father, thank you for teaching us about the power that lives inside of us. Lord, thank you for admonishing us, Lord, about the power of relationships through your word calling us to radical relationships, Lord, that only you can bring about through us. Lord, thank you for teaching us how critical these radical relationships are to fulfilling your purpose for us. Thank you for giving us a supernatural power with which to love one another. Lord, thank you that you've forgiven us and given us the power to forgive one another. Thank you that you've given us the power through your Holy Spirit to connect with one another, to love the unlovable, to show the world that you have sent Jesus as the Savior. Lord, help us to determine today, today, to have renewed emphasis 
on our relationships, to place renewed emphasis on the power of relationships for your glory and your namesake. Help us to stop trying to do it on our own and to start using all the spiritual tools you've empowered us with. Help us, Lord, to surrender fully, fully to the work of your Holy Spirit inside of us. Lord, as we ask you, as we ask you humbly, Lord, to use supernatural power through us to work radical relationships, to transform our hearts, Lord, we ask that you transform our church, transform our relationships, and transform the world in which we live for the sake of the gospel, for your namesake, Lord Jesus, so that all the world will see you, Lord, because you are coming, and you are the king, and you deserve all honor and all glory and all praise, Lord. You are the coming king, even so come. In Jesus' name, amen. 